history and your image in our neighbor. Forgive us, God of grace, and help us to throw down the stones of systemic sin so that we may builders of your reign of liberating love right here and right now in our world. Amen. Beloved, hear the good news proclaimed to all people everywhere. As God's claimed children, we have been set free to live and love, witnessing the Spirit speaking in abundant grace. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God of wisdom, just as you have given life and raised us up, breathe new life into these words so that we may set ourselves upon your pillars of love, justice, humility, and goodness. And in our being and doing, these pillars may imbue the foundations of our world. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Hebrew, chapter 10, verses 11 through 25. And every priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God and since then has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, said the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of the Lord.
Good morning. I invite all of our children to come forward for the time with children. Good morning. It is good to see you all this morning. Thank you so much for sharing your gift of music. The gift of music comes from God, and I'm so thankful to hear your beautiful voices this morning. So I wanted to talk about the gift of music since we were singing, and we sing um, and share the gift of music with each other every week when we come to worship, when we sing songs from our hymnal, um, we're sharing the gift of music when we listen to the choir each week. When you all get up here and share your gift, we're sharing the gift of music. I've been given the gift of music before. I have this um, from my grandma, and when I turn the back, it plays a song, and each time I listen to this song that it plays, I'm reminded of my grandma's love. And so that gift of music is something super special to me. And when you all sing, and you see, it's going to go on for a minute, so we'll just let it rest. <laughs> I might have twisted it too much, so it'll just keep going. It'll be fine. And so the gift of music is where we are able um, to tell God how much we love God. We're able to learn more about God when we sing through the words that we're singing. And we're able to share a about God to others when we sing. And this morning, as you sang a prayer, you sang a prayer asking God to be with you, to use your gifts in the world, for to use your joy to share, and for you to shine God's light. And you sang that that was a prayer. And so I hope that we can remember that prayer as we leave this space today and this week, the prayer that God is with us and to shine God's light and to walk with God wherever we go. So thank you for sharing your gift of music this morning. Let's go to God in prayer. You can put on your prayer hands and repeat after me. Loving God, thank you for the gift of music. For us to learn more about you, and to share that gift with others. Be with us this week as we share your love with everyone we meet. And we all say, Amen. Okay, friends, if you're in the younger choir, you can go off with Miss Becca to choir. If you're in the older choir or not in choir, you may go back um, with your families. Amen. Um, it's, the, uh, it's the last two verses in the Hebrews passage that I wanted to pick up on today um, that Don read for us. Thank you for that, Don. It's the last two verses. It says, let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, we know as Christians that there is some day yet approaching, 
that day yet approaching in which God will renew and restore and reconcile all things unto God's self. We know that it's coming, but knowing what to do until that day, well, that's kind of the tricky part, right? What do we do on the rest of the journey? How do we provoke one another to love and good deeds, as the author of Hebrew writes? Uh, How do we encourage one another while that day is still not yet? The same thing the early church struggled with is still the same thing we struggle with. This is hard enough to do on any normal day. It's a hard enough thing to do. Uh, Patience runs thin. Nerves get shot. We get antsy in our pantsies a little bit from time to time. It's a hard enough thing to do on a normal day, but it gets really tricky when times get tough. When we're standing at a precipice, when we sense that something new is being brought or being born or being birthed into our world and our lives, that's what I want to talk a little bit more about today. But first, let's pray. Holy, holy, holy God, source of all goodness. By your word, you give goodness to our souls. Pour out on us your spirit of wisdom and understanding that our hearts and minds may be opened in that way once again on this day. We love you, Lord. Amen. A reading from Mark chapter 13. As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be? What will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's my impression of birth pangs. How did I do? (laughs) Pretty good, right? I'm not always good at impressions, but that's pretty good, right? Uh, You can clap for me if you want. That was fine. That was good. That was good. All right. All right. I told a couple of small groups this week in the church as I was meeting with them, I said, fair warning, I'm going to talk way too much about birth pangs in this week's sermon. How do you feel about that? Um, Actually, what I said is I'm going to get up front and I'm going to go ahead and mansplain what birth pangs are all about (laughs) for everybody. How do you feel about that? And they said absolutely nothing. They just kind of ignored the question. Um, (laughs) Let this be a lesson for you. If I ask you a question, you should respond or you get sermons that start like that right there. Me personally, let's go ahead and clear the air. Me personally, I have never physically been through birth pangs. I've never had the experience of contractions. I've never had those sharp pains. I've never had the physical difficulties associated with birthing a child. I have not gone through that, me, myself. So my impression is based more on hearsay than physicality, but I still think it's a pretty good one. Now, 
Second point, my Meg has actually never been through the traditional birth pangs either. Um, she had what we like to call afterbirth pangs. Um, you see, she had a C-section. Um, our daughters were stubborn and breech. Come to think of it, they're still stubborn and breech sometimes. <laughs> But our daughters were stubborn and breached, and so the doctor recommended we have a C-section, and so we had a C-section. That means that Meg never actually went into active labor. She never went into the errs or the ahs. We never had that traditional birth pain, just the after pains of the doctor, you know, cutting you open and poking around a bit. Uh, that's what she went through. It wasn't really a choice we made, but it was a choice that we were okay with. And so let me tell you that story. You see, early on when me and my Meg were dating, we had only been dating about a year at this point, she cut her foot open, she cut it pretty bad, and she had to go get stitches. I took her to go get stitches, and we were supposed to go back about two weeks later to get the stitches out. We didn't make it two weeks later. It was more like three or four weeks later we went back to get the stitches out. And apparently, you're not supposed to do that, right? Stitches became a little impacted. They were harder to get to. There was a little bit more drama than was necessary on that day. Now, let me clarify. The drama did not come from my Meg. It came from me. It seemed pretty painful what they were doing. They were cutting in, and then they were cutting the stitches and pulling them out, and I was holding her hand, and she was grimacing the whole time. And before you know it, I was on the ground. <laughs> I had passed out. I remember slowly sliding down the wall. The procedure stopped. All the medical personnel came over to check on me all of a sudden. And then after my Meg had her foot procedure, she then had to drive me home afterwards. <laughs> So you see, it wasn't really a choice we made, but it was a choice we were okay with. Um, we didn't think that I could handle childbirth, um, and we're probably right on that one. So I never really went through it. Megan never really went through that sense of birth pangs either. Uh, her sister, however, Becca, had a very recent experience with it. Um, Becca, Rebecca Chancellor Six, passed her over at First Present Dallas. Um, you met her a few months ago at my installation service. She stood right here during the third hour of that program on that day. <laughs> Becca and James just had their second child about three weeks ago. Um, Ethan James joined little Claire Bear, who came up front here for the time with Younger Church just a minute ago. Uh, they're now a family of four, and she had it the old-fashioned way. She had EJ the old-fashioned way with the errs and the ahs, and so... They came over last night to watch the Cowboy game. Anybody want to talk about the Cowboy game last night? No? Okay. We'll leave that one alone. They came over last night to watch the Cowboy game, and we're hanging out. And I said, well, Becca, I just want to give you a heads up. You're mentioned in the sermon tomorrow. Um, I try to give a heads up when I do that. I don't like people to be caught off guard more so than when I shout into microphones. But... I wanted her to have a heads up. I said, I'm going to talk about you, and I'm talking about birth pangs. And while I got you, actually, let me get a pen and paper here. Would you go ahead and describe birth pangs for me real quick? Can you just lay that out? Uh, she kicked me and then walked away from me, so I don't really know what that was about. So I never had birth pangs. My Meg never had the traditional birth pangs. Uh, Becca was unwilling to help me with my sermon preparations this week for some reason. And so I had to look it up. First definition of birth pangs. You ready? First definition. This one is fascinating to me. Plural of birth pang. <laughs> I love it when dictionaries are so helpful, don't you? Uh, side note, though, I will say if you're a woman and you have figured out how to have just one birth pang, you could sell a lot of books. You could do very good with that. Uh, definition of birth pangs, plural of birth pang. Uh, second definition says the repetitive pains occurring in childbirth. Okay, we get that one. Third definition of birth pangs, this is where it starts to get more interesting to me. Difficulties, stress, etc., associated with the beginning or creation of something new. Difficulty, stress, etc., associated with the beginning or creation of something new. Well, now we're kind of getting somewhere, right? 
plural of birth pain, repetitive pains occurring in childbirth, difficulty, stress, etc., associated with the beginning or creation of something new. Now check out this fourth one. You ready? Disorder and distress relating to a major social or interpersonal change. Disorder and distress relating to a major social or interpersonal change. When something new in our world comes to be, when something different in our experience begins to take shape, a change takes place. And sometimes that change, that new thing, that something different begins to cause disorder or distress. Doesn't matter the change, that's just the nature of change. Sometimes when this change comes, it begins to cause disorder and distress, and they start to affect our world, and they start to upset our equilibrium, and they start to disrupt life as we know it, and that's when we experience birth pangs of this sort. That's the birth pain. Some things that happen around us almost seem to take on a life of their own, and when we see them being birthed into this world, well, it changes us. It can upset us. It can make us feel awfully uncomfortable sometimes. Birth pangs. It's a repetitive pain, birth pangs. It's a discomfort that's put on repeat, birth pangs. It's not a singular experience because we've all felt that one before. Perhaps we all feel it at some level too, still. Birth pangs. I think Jesus was talking about that kind of birth pain. I think Jesus knew all too well that kind of birth pangs. Jesus predicted birth pangs of that sort for God's people still to come. He says, For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places, there will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs, he says. The disciples were all busy talking about the temple at the beginning of this text. They were all focused on the temple. They were all impressed with the temple. And why wouldn't they be? It was an impressive temple. This was Herod's temple. This was the second Jewish holy temple, the temple. This is the one everyone would travel to. This is the one everyone would pilgrimage for. That is the temple they're at and they're talking about. Josephus, the famous first century historian, he actually went and measured some of the stones used in the construction for that temple, giving precise measurements, and they were indeed enormous. There was gold everywhere. The finest oak, cedar logs from Lebanon were used, marble upon marble upon marble in this temple. The dimensions, the splendor, the grandiose nature of this temple would have overwhelmed any visitor. It was designed to do just that, overwhelm them. And so the disciples, their reaction on that day was completely natural. You would expect that from them. They go into little red writing disciple, in my opinion. They say, ooh, what large stones you have, and ooh, what large buildings you have. But Jesus had already responded and already spelled it out. He said, yeah, the better to eat you with. You see, just a few verses before this, Jesus accuses the leaders within that temple of just that. He says they devour widows' houses for the sake of appearance, i.e., they ate grandma for an extra set of silver candlesticks. So while visitors might have been impressed, while the disciples seemed to be impressed, Jesus was not. So as they're walking out of the temple and they say, check it out, Jesus says, you want to check something out? If you want to check something out, if you want something to be impressed by, it's not this. 
Do you see these great buildings? Do you see these great buildings all around us? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. So don't get distracted by any of that. Don't get awestruck by all of that because it won't last. It don't pass muster. It ain't as good as it seems. Trust me. And you'll understand this. You will. You'll understand all this and more when that time comes, when that day arrives, when that something new appears. Don't be impressed with what is. Be impressed with what is to come. Because it's bigger. It's better. And it's way beyond what you're even imagining. Until that time, though, Jesus says, birth pangs. Well, the disciples seem to know where this is heading, and they don't like it. They kind of keep needling Jesus. They kind of keep finagling to get some more information at him. They said, well, well, when, Jesus? When's it going to happen? When's it all going to go down? How long is this going to last? How long are we going to have these birth pangs, as you call them? It doesn't sound fun, Jesus. It doesn't sound too pleasant. Can't we just skip to the end now? Can't you just take care of this one for us? Who really wants to go through birth pangs? Because birth pangs are real. The disciples knew it. We know it. Birth pangs are real. Whether you're talking about the good old-fashioned kind or whether you're talking about disorder and distress relating to a major social or interpersonal change, they're real. Birth pangs are real. I would not recommend walking into a labor and delivery ward and saying, is that real or are you really just kind of making this up? No. We know birth pangs are real. We know it. And they're not easy to deal with. They're just not. Whether they're at the societal level or whether they're at the individual level, I know this, you know this. It ain't fun. It ain't simple. It ain't easy. And they can get awfully loud sometimes, can't they, these birth pangs that happen around us. If you listen closely, if you listen really closely to the people marching with signs, they're going through them right now. They're having birth pangs right now in front of our eyes. If you listen super close, the people standing out there, standing up for what they believe in, their voices sound a lot like, ah, birth pangs. Sitting down to have an honest conversation Sitting down with people to talk about race or white privilege or about doing better with the next generation. The conversations all start the same way. Ooh, birth pangs. When you have to confront yourself, when you have to confront your own demons, when you have to confront a loved one, when you have to confront a friend because they need a friend who's going to treat them like they aren't a friend because they need to hear the truth. Anytime you confront like that, birth pangs. We know what they sound like. We know what they feel like. None of them are comfortable. None of these are happy, clappy experiences. And most of the time, we'd rather go sit in our ivory towers or in our marble temples we would much rather be in those places, but that doesn't seem to be where Jesus is interested in staying, now does it? That kind of shows us where we need to go too, doesn't it? Jesus doesn't shy away from these things. I don't think he wants us to either. Jesus seems to know it's not going to be easy but yet Jesus keeps pointing to just beyond. Only good news about birth pangs I can come up with. Only good news about birth pangs is that the birth seems to eventually happen. It seems to eventually come. The arrival of something new the life-changing presence of what was just created. And when it comes, it can be awfully cute and really beautiful. 
Donald Jewell of Yale Divinity writes this. He says, this image of birth pains employed here by Jesus, used by Paul elsewhere in the epistles, imagines the immediate future as a painful time that must precede the birth of a new age. He asks, how do we participate in that birth of the new age now? Morna Hooker of the University of Cambridge says, this word, birth pang, symbolizes the agony that can lead to a new beginning. And she says, what threshold of a new beginning are you at right now? Don Otani Wilhelm of Bethany Theological Seminary says, these are the signs that something new is about to emerge among us. And then she asks, are you paying attention to what is emerging among us? The only good news about birth pangs is that the birth does eventually happen. It'll come. God is renewing and restoring and reconciling all things. And we get to participate in that. But that might mean that there are some birth pangs along the way. So as we go through this together, as we go through these birth pangs, Hear the words from Hebrews once more. Let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, but encouraging one more, all the more as you see the day approaching. Birth pangs are real. Birth pangs can be hard. But I ask you to remind yourselves and remind others of the good news, the birth, the arrival, the creation of something new that's beautiful is what God is doing right now. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, all God shouldn't say, amen. amen.
At this time, we will not be passing the offering plates. Um, our gifts can be placed in, in the baskets in the narthex on your way out, or you can give online or by mail. Let us continue in worship as we offer our gifts, tithes, and offerings. Let us give. Let us pray. Holy One, may these gifts of time, talent, and wealth be midwives in the birthing of your realm on earth. Guide us that we use these gifts wisely and as you desire. Amen.
He- Hebrews tells us that we are to uh, provoke one another um, with love and good deeds. We're to encourage one another to go out and to be the people of God. Uh, but first also says that we're supposed to remember to meet together. Um, so we gather together in this place week after week. We gather together in this place um, because we feel God's presence as the body of Christ here. Um, nowhere is that more evident than when we come to the table and we have Christ's body and blood given for us. Let us be fed and let us be reminded at this time as we meet together in this very special way. Let us come to the table. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord. It is right. It is right to give you our thanks and praise, O holy creator God, who at this table suspends all sense of time, uniting us with what you have done in the past, how you spoke a word and brought all that is into being, how you blessed it, how you called it good, how you created us in your image and called us very good, and O God, throughout the ages, how you have continued to nurture our relationship with you, calling a people to yourself and offering love and mercy and forgiveness time and time again as we continue to grow into the love that you have for us and all creation. And, O oh God, we give you thanks that in the fullness of time we knew you fully in Jesus Christ, and that even as we sit at this table, at his table, that he is fully present with us now. And, O oh God, we give you thanks for the ongoing gift and experience of your Spirit who continues to call us into the future that you have created for all of us, one in which we will know the depths and the height and the breadth of your love in ways now that we only imagine. So, God, thank you for your faithfulness throughout our history in this moment, and that leads us into your future. We offer our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, who alone is the head of our church, and who teaches us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus was with his disciples that night when after supper he took the bread. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this remembering me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood and shed for the forgiveness of sins. And every drink of it, we do this in remembrance of him. Every time we eat of this bread and we drink from this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God of grace, God of great mystery, thank you for feeding us, thank you for assembling us, thank you for allowing us to glorify and enjoy you in all that we do. Send us out equipped to be your saints once again in this world, send us out to go and listen for those birth pangs around us. We pray this in your holy and loving name, and we love you, Lord. Amen.
Brothers, sisters, saints, I remind you once again, we go out of this place not alone, but we go out together as the body of Christ into this world. Uh, before we go, join with me one more time, would you? Uh, ah. You know what birth pangs sound like to me. What do they sound like to you? Go out into this world and listen. Go with the grace and the peace of the God who created you, the God who redeems you, and the God who sustains you now and forevermore. Amen.